A couple of months ago, my husband and I went road tripping across the United States. At about 3 a.m. one night, we stopped at a rundown gas station in the middle of nowhere. By the middle of nowhere, I really mean it, the middle of nowhere. This gas station was the only building in the area for miles. It was surrounded by just nothing but empty fields. It was two miles off the interstate. At 3 a.m., it was pitch black outside, and the lights at the gas station were the only thing that illuminated the area. Since the gas station itself was closed, though, we were the only people there. My husband filled up the Jeep, and we spent a few minutes rummaging through our bags. I couldn't seem to find my purse anywhere. After a while, an SUV pulled up right next to us. The driver was a man in his late 20s or early 30s. At that point, I was sitting in the passenger seat, and my husband was about to get into the driver's seat. The man approached my husband and said, I've lost my phone somewhere nearby. Have you seen it anywhere by chance? Suddenly, a sense of dread filled the pit of my stomach. As I observed the man closely, I noticed he already had a phone, a flip phone attached right on his hip. I studied his face. While he looked unassuming, there was something off about his gaze, something sinister. I must have left it in that field over there. The field he pointed to was pitch black. Can you help me look for it? My husband had already pulled his iPhone out and set his flashlight app up. He's such a good Samaritan, he'll try to help out anyone. He started to follow the man, but I quickly whipped out my phone and texted my husband to leave immediately. He saw the text and turned around to look at me. I must have looked completely terrified because he ran and jumped right back into the car and we booked it out of there. As we were leaving, I looked back and saw the man hurriedly jumping back into his SUV. We drove for about 20 miles on the interstate to a rest stop and slept there. After a short time, my husband woke me up and told me to look through the passenger side window. The man had pulled up right next to us. There were many empty parking spaces at this rest stop, yet he'd still parked right next to our car. The creepiest part is that we were parked at the very end. The spot next to us wasn't even a parking space. We had our seats down to help us sleep, so I don't think he'd seen us in our Jeep. We quietly watched him get out of his car, look over our Jeep and walk into the building, probably looking for us. As soon as he entered though, we snapped our seats back up and hauled ass out of there. We drove for another 50 miles and found a hotel about 6 miles north of the interstate. We didn't see the man again after, so I guess we lost him in the end. In the summer of 1999, my family and I took a trip to Yosemite National Park. While at the park, we stayed at a motel called the Cedar Lodge. It was a nice place in a remote part of the park. My 15-year-old self came down with a huge fever though, and instead of infecting everyone else, my mother decided to get a separate room for me. My time there was spent laying around in bed sick as a dog. When my AC stopped working, I called the front desk and asked them to come fix the damn thing. A short while later, the door just magically opened, and in comes this gruff-looking man with a very distinct handlebar mustache. After entering, he proceeded to just stare at me. I remember being pretty scared, actually, until I noticed he was in the motel uniform with a tool bag as well. This must have been the guy they'd sent to fix the AC. He didn't say a single word to me. He swiftly moved over to the AC unit, knelt down, and began fixing it. Every few minutes, though, he would turn around abruptly and stare at me like I was a piece of meat. The entire time, he never said a single word to me. After he was finished, he walked to the door and stopped as if he wanted to say something. He didn't, though. He just closed the door behind him. That was that. Fast forward a few days later, we'd arrived back in Florida after a great trip, besides me being sick of course. My grandparents and I were watching TV, 
The main story for the program that we were watching was a serial killer that had been caught in Yosemite National Park. I immediately started getting a strange sensation in my spine. They said his name was Kerry Steiner. Then, a picture of the Cedar Lodge appeared on the television. At this point, I was about ready to wet myself. I just knew I was going to see that mustache on the very next screen. Evidently, he'd murdered four women right before we traveled to the park. To this day, I still get shivers when I think about it. I was all alone with that man. He easily could have added me to his list of kills. It's strange when I think about all those gazes he gave me, probably contemplating about what he would do with my dead body. About six years ago, my neighbors went out of town for a while, and I was tasked with feeding their fish, as well as taking care of their house and the pool. This also meant I could use the pool whenever I wanted, so naturally I did what any 20-year-old would do. I brought my girlfriend at the time over there at night. It was a nice summer night with no wind at all. The moon was out with no clouds either. We couldn't figure out how to turn on the pool lights, so we just said screw it and went in anyway. With the moon being so clear and bright tonight, it was as if the light was on anyway. The only thing this really changed was that the water looked like a sheet of black glass in the moonlight. Imagine a peanut-shaped pool, where on one end was me and my girl swimming in the shallows, and on the other end was the deep end, with the water slide. We were just swimming along, not really doing anything wrong, maybe just a bit of hugging and talking. We both stopped dead, though, when we heard deep breathing. We looked over to the deep end of the pool, where the sound seemed to be coming from. In the moonlight, we could see the black silhouette of a head sticking out of the pool, right by the water slide. The noise was coming directly from that shape. Normally, that would be enough to scare anyone, but the part that really freaked us out was the feeling that we both got from whoever this was. It was a feeling like someone was twisting a knife in our gut, like something extremely evil and wrong was there. All I knew is we needed to leave right now. We didn't get away though. We stood there frozen in fear and looked at one another, then looked back at the shape. Whatever it had been, somehow it was already gone. There were seemingly no ripples in the water, no lighting changes. It was like it just disappeared, and with it went the deep breathing noise as well. We both got out and tried to see if there was someone in the pool with us that we didn't notice. There was nothing though. We both grabbed our towels and ran like we'd never run before. As I was running out of their backyard, my girlfriend was ahead of me. I crossed into the front yard when I felt two hands grab onto my shoulder blades. There was a forceful push that made me faceplant right into the grass. I got back up and continued running, but when I eventually looked back, there was no one there. After all these years, I tell people that it wasn't the head, the noise, or the push that scared me. It was that gut-wrenching feeling of something being extremely wrong that did. My ex will still not talk about it to this very day. I was playing with walkie-talkies as a kid. Those old 70s mega-sized walkie-talkies. It was summer and I was with my brother and three friends. We were all about 12 years old. As we were having fun together, suddenly a stranger's voice came across our walkie-talkies and began to talk to us. It was obvious it was a nearby person trying to mess with us, but he did it in a real sadistic way that still gives me chills to this day. I tried to tell myself it was a really sick joke or a prank. He was a grown man, not a kid or a young adult. As we listened to him, he began to tell us what we were all wearing and where we lived as well. How he was going to come over and rear and kill each one of us. He even mentioned what my friend had been wearing the day before, not currently. 
so we knew that whoever this was must be real, and he must have been following us long before this moment, in a super calm, serious, monotone voice with no laughter at all. He told us each of our names and our individual residences, also details that seemed way too observant, like when we'd last played at the basketball court together, as well as what we'd been wearing at that time too. The last time one of us went swimming, he even pointed out that my buddy loved orange creamsicles and he would grab one whenever we went to the corner store. That's all fine and dandy, but none of those areas were anywhere near each other for him to know this. He would have had to have followed us quite far. For him to be this specific and observant, he really knew a lot about us. The youngest of us, I'll call him Billy, he knew everything about Billy though. The things he liked to wear, the things he liked to do, even random stuff he did on a whim in relative privacy, so not a parent or someone who was watching us either. As he continued on, it wasn't only what he said though, as much as how he spoke also. He kind of spoke like how the Zodiac Killer spoke on the phone. That's exactly how he sounded. All of a sudden, in the middle of intimidating us though, he just stopped altogether. No see you soon or something similar. He just stopped talking. We tried to go back and forth, figuring out who this could be. When he'd stopped, he hadn't totally stopped though. He'd stopped responding to anything we said or did. But we could still tell he was listening in. We went from ha ha who is this to no really who is this? We tried pretending not to be terrified. We all stayed together at my house that night and on a dare we turned on our walkie talkies about two hours later. We didn't speak into them though, we just listened in for any sounds. It was completely silent except for the sounds he clearly wanted us to hear. We would hear a broadcast every ten minutes or so. The sound of walking around as he whistled a creepy tune, or what sounded like knives sharpening and rubbing on each other. After an hour or so of just listening to these bursts of sounds, he stopped in the middle of whatever he was doing. In one last transmission, he whispered, It won't be tonight, so you can all go to bed now. You're smart to stick together. That was it. There was never another direct transmission, but we thought we could hear similar random sounds about three days later. The adults got home about an hour after this all happened, and we explained it all to them. They took it as some fuck messing around, basically saying, Relax, you're fine, go to bed. It really messed with our heads though. I think they thought we were exaggerating, but something on a very deep level was disturbing about this. It wasn't us kids being scared of the boogeyman or something like that. It was my first real taste of what I'd call real sickness. I've dreamt about this incident a couple of times this year alone, dozens of times over the years since. His vocal demeanor was almost worse than what he said. How he gleefully spoke about how he would kill us as the others watched and nobody would ever be able to find our bodies. Depending on how good we acted, he would decide if we'd get to go back to our families. That kind of specific creepy stuff, told in a terrifyingly relaxed monotone. The horrible stuff he would say as if nothing was wrong at all. I hate to play it off as anything but a sick guy being sick and messing with us, but a couple of years after, a young boy really did die nearby. He suddenly couldn't be found. Then, his body was found nearby a couple of hours later. About a decade after that, another kid around the same age was horribly murdered, and it's never been solved either. It made the national news even. No connections, other than the town and general area, but it leaves very little doubt in my mind. I told the police this story way back then, and multiple times since, too. I hope it narrowed down the location of a suspect or place to look, you really had to hear this voice though, and what he said to really understand just how chilling it was. When someone knows who you are but you have no idea who they are, zero idea, it feels so scary. I don't know, you just had to be there.
My name is Jeremy. I live in California, and back when I was in sixth grade, I had a very close friend. Let's call him Devin. Devin was a super energetic kid, and we would always laugh and joke around, play ball at recess together. Those were some of the best days of my childhood, until Devin went and ruined it all. I had a strong, healthy childhood, and a great relationship with my mom and sister. Devin was not as fortunate, though. His mom was extremely irresponsible. She would frequently expose him to drug use, abusive boyfriends, and other horrific circumstances over and over. Sometime in the month of May, during the year this happened, Devin had become prone to extreme anger. Every time I tried to approach him, he would always scare me with the scariest look I had ever seen. One day, Devin never came back from recess. I was in the bathroom later in the day, and it sounded like some kid was laughing in the other stall. There was lots of this metallic tapping going on. I finished up quickly and ran out of there. As I was heading back toward the kickball field, something big and hard suddenly hit me in the back of my head. I felt blood began to trickle down my neck, and my vision immediately became blurry. I dropped to the ground unconscious. When I woke up, I found myself tied to a tree about 50 yards from the play area. My head seemed to have stopped bleeding, but it was still pounding intensely. I looked around in a daze, trying to figure out what just happened and who had done this to me. I tried calling out. Hey, this isn't funny. My head really hurts. I need to go to the nurse's office. It's all your fault. You've always had such a nice life, and I never did. I'm going to fix that. The person who walked around from behind the tree to face me turned out to be none other than Devin. I stopped struggling and heaved a sigh of relief, realizing this had to be a bad joke. When I asked him to untie me, though, he bent over and smiled a deranged and sickly grin. He proceeded to rant about how much he despised me. He was jealous of my life and how I had a mother who appreciated me and didn't treat me like an inconvenience. It was then that he pulled out a kitchen knife he'd stolen from the cafeteria. I looked on in pure terror as he licked the blade like some kind of fucking psycho. I began struggling with all my might to get free, but he had somehow gotten his hands on some climbing rope from the gym. There was no way I was going to be able to break free against that. He raised the knife and swung it down, slashing my arm and nicking the rope as well. I began crying, which only seemed to make him even more upset. He threatened that he would hurt me even worse if I didn't shut up. I began kicking and thrashing my body weight around in terror. Until the tear and the rope worsened enough for me to get free, I rushed Devin and pushed him down, then started running for the cafeteria, screaming my teacher's name at the top of my lungs. As I was running for my life, I could hear Devin ten feet behind me, keeping pace with my sprinting. Fortunately, my teacher heard my cries, and she witnessed Devin chasing me into the gym. Once we were indoors around other people, I thought I would be safe, but he still lunged at me, and we hit the wooden floor hard. My eyes went wide, and I suddenly felt time begin to crawl. He put his knee onto my back and raised the knife again. In that moment, I thought I would never see my mom or sister ever again. Suddenly, Devin was grabbed from behind by the gym teacher and restrained. We were surrounded by dumbfounded-looking kids as the cut from my arm was bleeding all over the floor. I was taken to the nurse's office and questioned by the police. Devin was eventually expelled from the school. Word stuck around about me being attacked after. I learned that day that you never truly know someone until you see the hatred in their eyes. I never saw Devin again, but I do hope he got the help he needed. This story contains elements of sexual abuse. I'm a 20-year-old woman. My story takes place when I was about 8 years old, though, in elementary school. 
I'm from Mesa, Arizona, and attended the same school from 1st to 6th grade. In the school I went to, it was a requirement to take music class every year. There was only one music teacher for every grade, and he had been teaching there for many years. He was a middle-aged, heavy-set man with black and gray hair, and a beard to match it. I don't remember all the details of every situation that happened with him, since it was about a decade ago, but I do remember some really weird and specific things about him. I remember he was very talented with many different instruments, and would often play some of them to impress the class. I also remember we had an activity we would do before class, where he would play music and everyone would run and skip and hop around in a circle. He would move around poking and prodding us while we ran. He would do this thing where if you were wearing shorts, a skirt, or ripped jeans with exposed knees, he would come up to you and tickle your knees. Then he'd squeal, naked knees, naked knees. I always hated when he did that. He was my teacher every school year, and even though he always weirded me out, he never really gave me that eerie pedo vibe. We had these little plastic recorders we would play sometimes in music class. It's like a small flute, I guess. The school provided white recorders for us, but I had my own black recorder at home. Being the unique kid I am, I brought my own. The teacher was excited to see I had my own one, and even asked if he could see it. When he took it, he started to play on it quite skillfully. He handed it back to me, and I noticed his spit all over it. I went to go clean it in the sink, but when I started to go over and wash it, he yelled at me and told me to leave it alone and sit down. I emphasized that I wanted to clean it off, and again he told me to leave it as it was. I refused to play my dirty recorder, and so he sent me to the office for not participating. A few years later in the sixth grade, I wanted to play the trumpet, so I decided to join the band. You can probably guess who the band teacher was. There were many occasions when he would pull up my shirt for me and told me it was a little low cut for a young girl, or touch my back or play my instrument and not want me to clean it afterward. If you play any brass, you know how gross that is. I especially recall one incident that happened at a band rehearsal. After the class had ended, there were only a handful of students left and a few parents left in the auditorium we'd practiced in. The teacher asked me to come with him into the music room and help him clean up, bringing the chairs and instruments and the like. I brought some chairs into the room, and I started to put a few things away. Then, though, he asked me if I could stay a bit longer to help him clean up some more, even though everything was pretty much done. I don't really remember anything after that. Nothing at all. Actually, I've always thought I said no because my parents were here or something, but I honestly don't remember what happened. All I know is that for years after that moment, I had a lot of issues that young girls shouldn't have. I suddenly became addicted to watching porn on my computer, I would make my dolls imitate having sex with each other. I started going to therapy after my mom found my Ken doll with the crotch area completely melted. I don't remember him molesting me, but I've read that traumatic memories can sometimes be blocked out and forgotten. Fast forward several years later, I got news that my old music teacher had been arrested for child molestation. A girl I knew from my old band class came forward and said he'd re-erupt her in the band room. It happened when being asked to help clean after class. After she spoke up, a few other people came out with more allegations against him. He was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years in prison. I have links to articles about his arrest. The article says attempted molestation, but he was convicted all the same. Mr. LaMonica... I don't know what you've done to me, but I hope I never see you again. Keep in mind that I'm a female, and this took place when I was 21. This encounter still scares me to this day. I used to work at a subway, mostly during the night shift. As some people know, some pretty interesting things are known to happen during such shifts. This particular one, though, was most definitely the worst I ever had. 
I was working alone during the closing shift one night. This old man, who looked to be about 80 years old, walked in and started asking for a meatball sub. He was asking in a very heavy Swedish dialect, though, so obviously I couldn't understand him very well. The language barrier seemed to really irritate him, and he attempted to even teach me a bit of Swedish for the sake of the order. I tolerated this short lesson and made a bit of small talk with him, as that's part of my job. He paid for his sandwich and left soon after. Not too bad, right? Wrong. He started coming in every single night, even on nights I didn't work, and would always ask to see me specifically. If I wasn't there, he would try to get my co-workers to give him my work schedule, and would only ever permit me to make his sandwiches. He would ask my co-workers to text me whatever he felt like telling me at any given moment. They would act like they were doing it. What they were actually doing, though, was texting me he was there, and that they were getting pretty creeped out by this guy. Luckily for me, though, it was against subway policy to hand out people's work schedules or personal info. The instances where I was actually there, he would come in and get the same thing every time. He would always tell me things like how pretty I was, and if I was just a few years older, I would be exactly his type. He would then proceed to tell me what he did to himself at home, while thinking of me. The weirdest thing is, he would always do this to the sandwich I'd made. These miserable attempts at flirting with me would continue for hours on end, even if I had other customers around. Remember, this guy was clearly like 80 years old. I told my manager about the situation, but she wasn't of much help at all. She would just check the camera from her phone every couple of hours while she sat at home. She wanted to make sure he wasn't bothering the other customers. Eventually, I went to my area supervisor, and he said if this guy showed up again, I was to call the police immediately. The following night, he did come back in, but unfortunately, I couldn't get to a phone. He had this crazy look in his eyes, and I was afraid of what might happen if I tried to do anything with him in front of me. I just made his sandwich and told him I had other things to do, that he had to leave so I could attend to my duties. Thankfully, he left without much fuss. I told my area supervisor again what happened, and he banned the man from the store. The next week, he came by right as I was walking up. I struggled in a hurry to get the gate open. He was trying to talk to me. At this point, I was visibly shaking, and I was just hoping he wasn't going to touch me. He was inches away from my face. He was so close to me, I swear I could smell what he ate that day. I proceeded to tell him that he had to leave me alone, as he'd been banned from coming to the store again. I told him if he didn't leave, I was going to have to call the cops. He glared at me. I see what kind of fucking person you are. You're just a bitch like everyone else around here. I thought you were different. By this time, I had fastened the lock shut and started walking away. Oh, by the way, once you're done calling the police, why don't you go ahead and fucking bleep yourself? I ran to my car and called my mom and fiancé and told them what happened. After that, my fiancé always walked me to and from my car and sat in the restaurant with me every night. I also started carrying a taser, a pocket knife, and pepper spray to protect myself at work. I won't go anywhere by myself anymore, and any time I see someone that remotely looks like him, I start to freak out and cry. About three months later, I left that job. I was too scared to be alone anymore. I found out later that not only had he stalked me, but some female workers at Walmart as well. He would find out where their cars were parked and leave things he'd found in the garbage as gifts, along with creepy love notes. I also found out he would hop from subway to subway and do this to whatever female worker he happened to choose as his target. I hope I never see him again. Back in 1984, when I was still just a baby, my parents were having a real tough time making ends meet. That was all because my parents thought it would be a genius idea to have four kids with no savings to speak of. They couldn't even afford an apartment, so we had to move into a local motel with weekly rates. 
we lived there for about a year or so. My dad was the only one working, and my older sister was in second grade at the time. My mom was stuck tending three children under the age of four for most of the day. She had to do it all on her own, too. I don't remember living there really since I was so young, but I was told about the place more once I started growing up, which I assume was a reminder of how far we had come as a family. One morning, when Dad was getting ready for work and Mom got my older sister ready for school, Mom noticed the shadow of a man against the pulled curtains of the bedroom. My mom is a notorious scaredy cat, so she hustled my sister toward the bathroom where my dad was, then hissed that there was someone outside the window peeking in. My dad kind of rolled his eyes at her, but looked out toward the front anyway to see if he could see anything. When he really saw the shadow there, his attitude changed quickly. He snuck quietly across the room and opened the door. The man who had been standing outside the window immediately turned and ran away from the motel. He ran out into the street and traffic blindly. My dad narrowed his eyes at the retreating man, then closed the door, figuring if the guy was violent he would have tried to start some shit right there instead of running away. He advised my mom to keep the curtains closed over the windows and to stay home with the door locked until he got back. My mom didn't want my dad to leave, of course, but he reminded her that he had to, or else he wouldn't get paid for the day. Mom reluctantly agreed and sent my dad and sister on their way. Later that afternoon, I was being an annoying little crybaby, so mom instructed my older brother to play quietly with my younger sister and watch Sesame Street while she tried to soothe me into a nap on the couch. My mom was sitting down patting my back, while I bawled my eyes out for no reason. She glanced out the front window to check if anyone was there. Sure enough, there was. My mother freaked out, snatching me up from the couch, which caused me to cry even harder than I already was. She locked the three of us in the bathroom together so she could call my dad at work. Then she locked herself in with us after she did so. My dad skipped out of work and ran back home. When he got there, the guy was still standing at our window with his hands cupped around his face like he was trying to get a better look into the gap in the curtains. My dad didn't even give this guy a warning. He just slammed him in the back of the head as soon as he got close enough. The man stumbled away from the window in a daze and my dad smacked him around silly, all while yelling things like, you think it's okay to scare people, huh? You think it's okay to scare my wife and kids? I'll show you what happens to fuckers like you who creep around windows. My dad hit him many times before the motel manager showed up and stopped him, thinking my dad was just beating some random guy to death. The window creeper got away during the confusion. He never did come back after though, so I guess that's a victory in the end. My mom and I were living in a small house in Laguna Beach back in the early 80s. My mom was out of town one day, and I was home alone. Before I went to bed, I made sure to lock all the doors and windows. This was around the same time when Richard Ramirez was terrorizing Southern California. I woke up in the middle of the night suddenly because my dog who was sleeping on the bed with me started to growl. I looked around to see why he was growling, only to see the figure of someone standing in my kitchen, staring into my bedroom. I couldn't make out any features, or even any clothing at all. They were just a dark shape. They didn't move or make any noise. They just stood there. I ducked under the covers in terror, and my dog jumped off the bed and ran out of the room. I couldn't hear anything else. Eventually, after hours of being terrified, I fell asleep out of exhaustion. When I woke up in the morning, I double-checked all the doors and windows, but they were all still locked. My dog had somehow gotten outside onto the back porch, though, so I guess that's how they got in in the first place.
About 10 years ago, I had just started dating this girl I had a massive crush on. We were fresh out of high school, and her parents were out of town for the weekend. That meant I was finally gonna stay at her house that night. I was so amped up, I was having trouble sleeping. I have a bit of trouble falling asleep in a new place though, so I was awake well after she'd already fallen asleep. I tried to keep my eyes closed and let sleep come naturally. Just as I'd actually started to drift off though, I heard a sound like scratching on wood. It was quick and getting even faster. I opened my eyes and oriented myself again. I started to notice that it didn't seem to be scratching at all. It was whispering and it was getting louder. My girlfriend was staring right at me and was rapidly whispering something. The whispering continued until suddenly she stopped mid-sentence. She closed her eyes and rolled over, leaving me with a very what-the-hell feeling. I asked her about it in the morning, and she said she used to talk in her sleep a lot as a kid. I have no idea if she was just messing with me or what, but it was easily the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in the middle of the night. I don't believe in ghosts, but there was something that woke me in the middle of the night. My family and I were in our cabin in the mountains, far away from civilization. I didn't see anything at first, but when I woke up with a start, I found I couldn't move at all. I held my breath out of fear. Sleep paralysis, maybe? Suddenly, I heard my mother from the adjacent room, whispering my name as if trying to get my attention. I was too paralyzed to reply though. Eventually, I fell back asleep out of terrified exhaustion. The following morning, my mother said she'd seen me sleepwalking. My sister said that she too had awoken with a start, and she'd also seen me walk by her bedroom. Thing is, I don't sleepwalk. I'd been laying down in my bed the entire time. This was probably 10 years ago. I was about 13 years old and I was at my house with my brother, who was around 11. There were also two of our friends and neighbors, who were brothers as well. They were the same ages as us. Both our parents and their parents had gone out together for the evening. Our house has large double front doors, the second of the two doors, which is hardly used has a locking mechanism where you have to unlatch it along the bottom of the door frame to open it. The main door is just your standard front door though. We were playing video games in the basement when I decided to let our dog out for a while. I went upstairs and unlocked the main door. I let her out and shut the door behind me, then locked it again. I went back downstairs and we continued to play whatever it was we were playing. I totally lost track of time though. My friend named Steve noticed that our dog was now sitting next to the couch we were on. I was so confused. Had our parents perhaps returned home without me noticing? I hadn't gone back up to let her back in. I called upstairs for my parents, to which I received no response. As I looked up, I noticed both of the front doors were now wide open. Not only had the main one been unlocked and opened, but the latch on the second one had been undone too and that door had also been left wide open. I was immediately terrified. I slammed both doors shut and locked them, then grabbed the home phone and sprinted downstairs. I let the others know what happened, and we hunkered up together in a spare bedroom. We called our parents, and they immediately left where they were to head home. Nothing ever came of it in the end, though. To this day, I have no way of explaining how those doors opened but it was completely terrifying. My wife and I were out camping back in 2012. We had spent 52 nights in the backwoods that year. Every weekend, we would camp on Vancouver Island and enjoy the solitude together. We were on a beach a good distance away from anywhere. 
To get to the trail to leave the beach, there was a kilometer long stretch along the beach you had to walk on and two kilometers to the road through the forest. There was nobody there except a guy named Leon from New Zealand. We had met him earlier that day on the beach. He was planning on sleeping in his van just up the road. We'd invited him down to the beach to join us by our fire, and we brought out a bottle of wine we could share. He came out and we talked about all sorts of things. As the three of us were hanging out together though, we kept on hearing what sounded like female voices. It sounded like they were coming from behind us hidden in the bushes. I figured it was someone who had anchored offshore, and the sound was bouncing in a weird way towards all of us. All three of us clearly acknowledged, though, that we really could hear these voices. It was getting quite late at night, so Leon hiked over to his van. We stoked the fire, because my wife was creeped out. We stayed up very late, and eventually the voices stopped altogether. We decided to put out the fire and go to bed. We'd scanned the cove with a flashlight several times, looking for any boats that could be the source of the talking. It must have been about 3 a.m. when we were risen again. It was about 15 minutes after we'd initially laid down. We heard footsteps in our camping area. They were over by where the fire was, and they'd come from the direction of the bushes. That direction was not easily transversible by people. We laid there, hoping it was a bear or something, because the island did have black bears. They were easy to deal with, though. You could just scare them away. The footsteps went from the fire, then over to our tent, then back to the woods. Five minutes later, the footsteps went back to the fire. We could hear two female voices talking gibberish very loudly. They were having a full conversation in the dead of night, so far away from civilization, without using any lights to navigate through the dense brush. After they were done at the fire pit area, they walked over to our tent, still talking, they began to circle around us. We couldn't make out anything they were saying. It all seemed to be just gibberish, or perhaps another language. Whoever this was stood over us and continued their conversation for minutes on end. Then it went completely dead silent. They went back into the woods, never to be seen or heard from again. We just laid there, completely frozen and afraid, for who knows how long. We woke up around 11 a.m. the next day because we'd had such a late night. That was the last night we stayed outside for at least a year. This story is told from the perspective of a female. I'm 33 years old, but this story took place when I was 18. I had this friend named Xavier who lived across the street from my apartment building. We hung out quite a lot. I met him through a guy named Jake. At first, he came off as very charming. We began dating, but after a short while, I realized his sweet attitude was just a facade. He was a bit of a pothead who would become violently jealous if he even thought other guys were looking at me. He even told me I wasn't allowed to go to the club because he didn't want other guys hitting on me. Eventually, he started harassing me for money to buy pot. He never did lay a hand on me, though, until one day when he demanded money from me, and I refused. Usually, he would just whine like a bratty little child for hours on end, until I finally relented and gave him some cash to shut him up. This time, though, he decided to slam my head against the air conditioner in his room. I shoved him off and walked past him and out of his apartment, telling him we were now through. I was actually secretly relieved he'd given me such a concrete reason to finally end it, because now I could go hang out with my friends again. Skip ahead to that weekend. I'm at the club, and he shows up to harass me about breaking up with him. Thankfully, the bouncer noticed him pretty quickly and threw him out. Every weekend after that, he tried getting back into the club to harass me, but was never allowed in. I heard through a male friend of mine that he was spreading nasty rumors I had an STD. He'd also asked a guy I knew to hack in my computer and plant a virus. One weekend, this guy I didn't even know came up to me in the club and told me Jake had given him a knife outside and told him to go inside and kill me. 
because nobody would ever dare to leave Xavier. I should have called the cops, but I didn't, mostly because I was young and foolish. I was determined not to be intimidated by these guys. I made sure my male friends would walk or drive me home and watch my back, skip ahead a few months, and Jake disappeared just like that. I stopped being harassed by him with no explanation. I was thrilled that this had happened, don't get me wrong. I eventually heard through my friend that Xavier had been arrested as well. Apparently, he and his friend had beaten a guy into a coma with a skateboard. Skip ahead ten years later. I get a message on Facebook from him telling me he's out of prison and that he wants to get back together with me. He saw that I was married with kids, but regardless, he said I should leave my husband to be with him and that he would take care of me and my kids. I thought, you think I would leave my husband for a crazy convict stalker? He told me how his mother died and left him a place in Manhattan and I should come to live with him. Without even pausing to breathe, he then asked me for nudes. I immediately blocked him. About two years later, my good friend went missing in the Bronx after leaving his brother's house. A few weeks later, they found his body in the river. As far as I know, they never found out who killed him. Those two may have had nothing to do with it, but they're the only violent people I ever knew. Sadly, my friend left a daughter behind, who now has no dad. As far as I know, Jake is still wandering the streets of New York City. I'm going to start this by saying I'm a pretty big nerd when it comes to anime, so I naturally love attending conventions while cosplaying. My husband and I had recently attended an anime convention, but unfortunately my experience was ruined when I encountered someone I hoped to never see again. Thankfully he didn't actually recognize me, but regardless it brought back an awful memory I had managed to bury deep within my subconscious. I'm a 22 year old woman, but at the time of this chilling event, I was only 15 years old. My friends and I were attending our very first convention. It was a smaller than average one, I suppose, but we didn't really mind. We were just happy to take part in the experience. We met some great people there. There was one person I had a confrontation with, though, that will forever be burned into my memory. We decided on the first day of the convention to make sure and coordinate our cosplay outfits. We'd all decided to dress up as Vocaloids, which are a group of anime hipster characters based off different text software companies. I'm not joking, by the way. You can Google them and see they're real. We were exploring, taking pictures, and having a good time when we saw someone dressed up as a fellow Vocaloid. Thinking, what are the chances, we decided to ask him if he'd mind taking some pictures with us. He agreed with a good-natured smile on his face, and we had someone take a few group photos of all of us together. Afterwards, we made some small talk with him, and he introduced himself as Patrick. He said he would introduce us to some other cosplay enthusiasts. We agreed because why not? That was kind of in the spirit of why we were all there anyway. We met up with Patrick's friends shortly after, and they informed us there would be a party in their hotel room later on. We were all invited. We reluctantly explained to them that we were quite underaged. Patrick's friends apologized for the misunderstanding and told us that instead we would see them around the convention and to have fun and stay safe. It seemed like they were having quite a hard time convincing Patrick to leave with them though, as it looked like he wanted to linger and talk to us. Eventually, he was made to begrudgingly leave our group and join his friends at their continued insistence. We told them goodbye and that we might catch up with them tomorrow. It was getting quite late anyway. All the panels that were still open were strictly 18 years and older audiences. Patrick shrugged. Well, it's not like any of you haven't seen hentai before, so having an age limit is pretty much bullshit. He offered to buy us hentai books from the vendors if we decided we wanted some. Of course, if you actually know what that is, we were far more embarrassed than flattered. 
He did have a point, given we had all experienced hand out the graphic novels at one point or another. We told him good night, though, and went back to our room, without really thinking much about him. The next day, we got an early start, and dressed up in different cosplay outfits. I decided to dress up as Lolita for the day. We bumped into Patrick downstairs, and he injected himself into our group again. We were all having a great time, but after a while, I started to realize that he was just constantly staring right at me, not in a shy or subtle way either. I was wondering if maybe the bow of my outfit was crooked, or if my contacts were messed up or something. I asked him if something was wrong with how I looked. He replied almost too quickly. No. I guess I forgot to mention to you ladies that I'm a big Lollicon fan. You just look really cute. I felt myself blush and wondered just how hard of a Lollicon fan he was. Was he the type that looked at all sorts of child-themed mineral? I eventually tried to brush off his statement and have some fun. After a short while, we made our way down to the vendors, and I ended up getting separated from my friends. Somehow, I found myself all alone with Patrick. I was suddenly feeling very vulnerable. I pulled out my phone to call my friends so we could regroup. I then realized my phone was dead. Swallowing my pride, I asked him if I could borrow his. He told me his phone was up in his hotel room, and if I didn't mind, we could go up there together and get it. I replied that I would simply find my way back on my own and plug in my phone instead. He seemed aggravated by my apprehension and insisted it would be quicker to just get the phone from his room. Being the dumb and trusting girl that I was at the time, I gave in and followed him up. On the way up, he started telling me about this hentai comic he'd read about an elementary school girl who lies to an old man about her age, telling him she's in high school and willingly having sex with him. I was more than slightly creeped out by that. It only got worse when he proceeded to tell me he got really turned on by a certain scene involving the character I was dressed up as. Wouldn't it be so great if I could reenact it for him? Before I could think of an excuse to separate myself from him, we were outside his hotel room. I told him I would wait outside while he grabbed his phone, but he insisted I come into the room with him. It would only be a minute after all. It was easier to just accept than to argue, so I went in and stood in the doorway while he went over to his bag on the bed. He began digging around inside. While he was preoccupied, though, my eyes wandered around the room, trying to find anything I could use as a weapon should I need one. I noticed a charger hanging out of a wall outlet and grabbed it. I figured I would lock myself in the bathroom and plug my own phone in. Then I could just call for help. I told him while he searched that I would use the restroom and I would be right back out. He turned and looked at me with the most sadistic look I had ever seen and asked me if I would rather just use him as a toilet instead. Without even thinking twice, I abandoned my plan to hide in the bathroom and sprinted out of there. I sprinted down the hallways and the stairs back to my own hotel room. When I reached the room, to my surprise, my friends were already there. They had been waiting for me. They figured my phone had died and that I would make my way back to charge it up. I explained to them what happened and told them to avoid Patrick at all costs. We hung out in our room to calm down for a while and avoid bumping into Patrick for as long as possible. We eventually left the room a few hours later, sticking together as a tight-knit group. Eventually, we encountered Patrick's group of friends from the day before. They asked us if we had seen him around anywhere. We replied and told them no. One of the women in the group informed us that we should steer clear of him because he seemed to have an unhealthy interest in young girls. We asked him why they were at the convention with him then if he gave them such bad vibes. They told us they had been friends with him for a while and they had to keep an eye on him as best they could to prevent him from doing anything bad. Occasionally, he would slip away out of embarrassment. I didn't say anything to them about what happened with Patrick. Apparently, he still goes to conventions in my state all the time. I know this because my husband and I bumped into him last year. I was relieved when he didn't recognize me and didn't try to approach me either. Due to my husband being with me, I guess Patrick didn't want anything to do with it. 
I hope he hasn't successfully baited any other girls into his room. One day, I was taking a nap in my bedroom. At some point, I woke up and thought someone was in the room with me. Sure enough, it looked like my girlfriend was quietly moving around the room, probably going in and out of the bathroom or changing clothes or something. I'm a very light sleeper, so it didn't surprise me that she'd accidentally woken me up. No big deal. I just try to get back to sleep. When I didn't hear her leave, though, I started to wonder. I couldn't really see her, as it was pretty dark. All I could see was that it was the silhouette of what appeared to be a woman. I was pretty sure it was her, though. At one point, I saw her just standing there staring at me. I asked her what was up, but she didn't respond at all. Hey, what is it? Nothing. I reached over to grab my cell phone and shine some light on her to see what she was doing standing there. As I looked up to get some light into the room though, she was already gone. The room was empty and I was all alone. I didn't think she'd left as I was reaching over to grab my cell phone. The bedroom door squeaks like a motherfucker and it had been dead silent, aside from my white noise machine that is. There was no one in the attached bathroom either. I wasn't sure what happened, but it kind of ruined my nap though. My girlfriend was in the house, but when I asked her, she said she didn't come into my bedroom while I was napping. If that wasn't her, then who was that in my room? What did I see? Was I still mostly asleep? I sleep so lightly that I don't really have an in-between state, so I would assume that's not the case. As far as I can recollect, I was fully awake and alert. I still have no idea what happened on that day. About three or four years ago, I'm 18 now, my brother and I shared a room. We had these twin beds that had drawers on one side. They were hollow on the other side though, so they were meant to be put against the wall and be incredibly easy to move. My parents had just finished yelling at me about something or other, and I had gone to my room to do some homework. It was completely silent for a good while, when suddenly I began to hear the sound of shuffling in my room. Naturally, I got creeped out and started to look around for the sound. When I calmed down and got back to my work, the same shuffling began again. This time, I looked up just in time to see my brother's bed moving upward slightly. By that time, my heart had completely dropped out of my chest and I sprinted out of my room to go find my parents. When they came back to the room, they didn't find anything except the bed now flipped upward. I didn't go back to sleep for the rest of the night. I was on a stag do in Amsterdam. The theme was rugby players, so we were all dressed up in the 70s style Wales rugby tops, white shorts and red socks. We had been drinking since about 9am. Around about 5 or so, a couple of us had lost the main group, so we went to the bar. One of the boys rolled up a joint. I never mix alcohol and weed, but for some reason I decided to do so that night. Not even halfway into the joint, I could feel that familiar whiting feeling. I didn't know the guys I was with that well, and I didn't want to go crazy right in front of them. I mumbled some excuse and tried to leave. I had a map, but if I stopped to look at it, there was a chance I could be sick. Also, I thought I had a pretty good idea of how to get back to where I was staying. Turns out, I really didn't. I kept staggering around in different directions, trying to get back. I wasn't too worried or anything. I would either find my way back there or end up getting a taxi eventually. I started to notice, though, that there were no people around me, and the area I was in was not lit up at all. It looked more like a housing estate than the center of a city. At some point, I looked behind me and found a group of about four to five guys stalking behind me. 
I did a few turns here and there completely at random, and they followed me quite closely. I was freaking out big time. I knew if I stopped to look at that map to find out where I was going, I would be mugged immediately. I needed to look like I knew where I was headed, and that I wasn't completely lost. Hard to do when you're dressed in rugby gear and staggering all over the place. Using the looking down a street to the side technique, I could see the men were getting closer and closer to me. I was getting ready to be knocked on the back of the head when I came across a street that finally had decent street lights on it. Luckily, a taxi happened to be passing by as well, and I flagged it down. I got out of there before the guys could reach me. It had turned out I had walked 8 kilometers in 4 hours. I was way off the tourist map I had. Now, whenever I'm somewhere foreign, I make sure I know exactly how to get back to where I'm staying. Because you never know what could happen when you're in a foreign country. I was 15 on some church trip to the University of Tennessee for a big youth conference one summer. Everyone stayed in the various dorms, guys on the guy floors which were even, and girls on the girl floors which were odds. I roomed in Macy Hall on the fourth floor. It was late at night and I was sneaking over to the girls floor below to meet up with a fellow Christian and get to better know her. When I poked my head out from my room to check for any chaperones, I began to hear a girl softly crying. It sounded like it was coming from my floor, so I checked around both corners of the U-shaped hallway. I checked the bathroom too, but I couldn't find anyone. The crying still continued though. It was a very pitiful sobbing, but very quiet. I was more curious than creeped out at this point so I snuck downstairs to see if I could still hear the sound down there. It was on my way anyway, so it's not like it caused me any trouble. Right when the door to the stairwell closed though, the sound stopped completely. When I opened it back up, I began to hear the sobbing again. I pretended in my mind it was just some TV or radio playing too loudly, and continued quietly down the flight of stairs to scope out the third floor for more chaperones. As soon as I cracked open that door though, the sound of the girl crying returned immediately. Somehow it was the exact same volume as well. Nobody was awake on that floor, so I looked around both corners again to see if I could find anybody there. There didn't seem to be anyone around, just this disembodied sobbing. That's when I started to feel really anxious about this whole thing. I told the girl I was meeting up with and her roommate about the sound when I got to their room. When they went out to check the bathroom for a crying girl though, there was nothing there either. In fact, they said there was no sobbing sound at all. I wasn't going to let it deter me from getting an inexperienced handy, and when I left the room a bit later, the crying was gone from both floors. I really don't know what to make of it. Maybe it was my imagination or something, but I distinctly remember making a conscious decision to look for the source so that I wouldn't have to worry about it creeping me out later. That makes me believe it really must have been happening in the environment around me. This is something that happened about 8 or 9 years ago. I would have been around 25 at the time. I live in London and my parents live outside it. I think I had gone back for the weekend or something. They had mentioned to me that they would be out at a concert, so I should let myself in and they'd probably see me the next day, unless I was going to be staying up very late that night. Anyway, I logged onto their computer and went to use the internet. I was listening to some music when I started to hear my brother walking around in his room upstairs. I was kind of used to this sound, so I didn't really give it a second thought. The muffled footsteps continued to walk around his room for a while before walking up the corridor and into the bathroom upstairs. A while later, I figured I'd go upstairs and say hi to him. I walked upstairs, only to find no one there. I saw the door to his room open though. I looked in his room, my room, the bathroom, there was no one there. 
I was thinking, what the fuck? Maybe he'd gone to see his girlfriend without me hearing. I go downstairs, sit down at the computer, and call my mom on her mobile phone. I couldn't get through, probably because they were still at the concert. I decided to try again later. She picked up the phone while they were on their way back home, though, and I asked if my brother was going out tonight because he'd left really quickly earlier. What she said next gave me chills. What do you mean? He came to the concert with us. He sat here right next to me. My jaw dropped and I ran to lock all the doors. I just sat on a chair staring at a wall until my parents got home. I was too scared to even turn around. I don't believe it's anything paranormal or anything like that. But man, the absolute shock of hearing my mom say he's in the car with us when someone else had been in the house made me want to vomit immediately. Usually, people find me to be somewhat creepy because of my bizarre fashion, build, and accent, but I actually have a creepy story that happened to me. One time, I had gone to the local library to print out a school assignment. My home printer wasn't working at the time. I did print it out, but sadly, as I was going to leave the library, this strange kid started to pester me. He walked up to me and asked me if he could stab me in the eye with his pen. Needless to say, I was extremely confused. I tried to walk past him, but instead he blocked my path. There was a cop nearby, so if I tried to push him out of the way, they would have been right on my ass, and I knew that kid could have made it way worse on me if I tried. He just kept asking me again and again if he could stab me, and what would I do if he gouged my eyes out? I told him to try it if he felt so tough. He was too short and my leather was thick as hell, so I wasn't too worried about him trying to get through. Damn did he try his hardest though. He kept stabbing me over and over before his friends rushed over and told him to leave me alone. I think he'd actually managed to poke a hole in my leather. As I left, he kept staring at me with the most furious look on his face. I never saw him or his friends again but I imagine he's up to no good now. When I was 10, me, my sister, and her friend were staying with my mom for the summer. It was for a few weeks in a really small village in Scotland, near Aberdeen City. We lived in Glasgow, also in Scotland, not the Australian one. We were not used to these tiny villages, so the place to us seemed harmless. Right through the village ran a quite busy road, especially for delivery trucks and tractors. At the top of the village where my mom lived was a small shop, and at the bottom was a much larger shop. So this day we were walking down the main road to get some decent sweets and juice from the larger shop, then pop over for some fish and chips or something. All of a sudden, this car drives by with two guys in it, both about their early 30s or so. They were blasting their music, shouting profanities out the window. Not particularly unusual. Guys trying to scare the shit out of young girls seems to be a common pastime for many the asshole. So, we keep walking. When we notice the car starting to drive by more and more, multiple times... That meant it was purposefully going to the top of the village, doing a U-turn, and doing the same at the bottom, just to freak us out. Well, I got freaked out enough that I decided to call up my mom. She told us not to worry, and that people like that didn't dare to cause trouble in such small towns usually. Just continue on our way. As we were coming to a lay-by in the road, with some benches and a World War II memorial, the car came racing down and pulled in so fast, a guy jumped out and began to charge at us, his friend maniacally laughing in the driver's seat. We were so surprised we were frozen still. Luckily for us, at that exact second, my mom came running down the hill. The man who had been charging at us bolted back to the car and they both drove off in a hurry. Who knows what would have happened if my mom hadn't turned up. She said she'd gone off the phone and thought she may as well take a jog down to us just in case. 
We did give statements to the police, but nothing ever came of it in the end. Back when I was about 16 or so, my friends and I would always do some delinquent stuff. Being young boys, we decided to make bombs out of dry ice, water, and plastic bottles. So we go down to the beach at about midnight or so, and just start blowing up piles of sand and whatnot. Good old-fashioned boy stuff, you know? We were walking down the beach with our homemade IEDs, just enjoying ourselves and having a good time. As we were walking, probably at about 1 or 2 a.m. at this point, we see someone approaching us in the distance. It was a cold and foggy night, so you couldn't see more than about 40 feet in front of you or so. It was a person-shaped thing coming our direction, but from the other side of the beach. We were near the sandy dunes, and they were more towards the ocean. As they started to get closer, I began to see their shape better, illuminated by a pale moonlight and the glare of the fog. They were wearing what looked to be a fisherman's outfit. They had the big long coat, the hat, the boots, the whole works. At first, I was thinking, great, he's gonna come talk shit and yell at us kids. But no, he didn't attempt to say anything. As he got closer, I could see he was dragging something long behind him, lurching forward and lugging it about. I began to see it was this huge chain, like the kind you'd see on an industrial boat anchor or something. The links in the chain were probably just about smaller than my wrist. I'd estimate they were about 5 by 10 inches in dimension. They were huge as fuck. And the chain wasn't like four feet long either. We're talking a 30 plus foot chain. Seeing this dark figure lugging this massive chain down the beach in the middle of the night was bone chillingly creepy. Hair stood up, hearts started pounding. We all stopped and watched this creepy fuck walk down out of sight, dragging this long chain behind him. Later on, I posted on Facebook about this, and a friend of mine didn't believe me said I was making shit up. Well, my other friends attested to the truth. We really had seen it. After doing a bit of research, he then linked me to a website that had a book about ghost stories on the Oregon coast. There was a story about a lost soul of a fisherman who would drag chains down that particular beach at night. I almost fucking shit myself. There was no way anyone could drag that huge of a chain down the wet sandy beach by themselves. It had to have weighed like a thousand pounds. So, yeah, turns out it was a fucking ghost from a ghost story, a legend where I lived. I was 16 or 17 when this happened. My boyfriend and I had just had a big fight while at my house. He got on his bike and rode home. In my mind, I thought the most logical thing to do in that moment was to jump on my bike some 10 minutes after he'd already left and try to catch him before he got home. Obviously, that was never going to happen. Anyway, I didn't want anyone to know that we'd had a fight, so I sort of snuck out without anyone knowing. I was about three minutes into my secret bike ride when a car slowed down next to me. The driver wound down his window and began yelling incoherent gibberish at me and gesturing to pull over. Another car came up behind him, so he just parked right there in the middle of the street. I turned down the next street to detour back home, only for the man to find me again, this time on a much quieter street though. I was in complete freakout mode by this point and kept shaking my head. Somehow, I managed to dodge him by riding in between things. Thank goodness bikes can get the places cars can't. I continued the ride home, only for the man to appear behind me again and attempt to run me over this time. When he missed me, he continued driving onward and disappeared into the night. With jelly legs, I rode home and couldn't walk normally for about a half hour, even after I made it home safe and sound. And the creepiest part is that no one in my family even knew I had left, so it could have been ages before anyone even knew I had gone. 
That seriously strange car driver seemed genuinely angry at me for no reason. It almost felt personal, but I had never seen him before, and I haven't seen him since either. When I was 12, I had just moved to Connecticut with my mom. We moved into a new development of the typical three-story townhome. It was around 5 o'clock midwinter, so it was already dark this day. Snow was falling everywhere. I decided to take the mutt on a walk to do a little exploring. We started down the street of our court. It was not five minutes in, though, when this creepy windowless van, also known as a rear van, crept by. It was grayish blue and had rust spots all over. Just the sight of this van kind of spooked me. I decided to cut through a gap in the buildings to another part of the development. After climbing through two feet of snow, I made it to the next street over, and the van was nowhere to be seen. I started walking again, only to see the van coming down the street toward me. This time, the dog and I sprinted down to the next gap and trudged through the snow to another street. About two or three minutes went by, and my senses were on high alert at this point. The dog and I were walking who knows where, when I saw the van cut ahead of us again, the exhaust coming from the back as it idled near the side. I stood there for a moment, trying to figure out our next move. I saw the white reverse taillights come on. Now, let me tell you, I thank my lucky stars I had a two-year-old golden retriever who could keep up. I never ran so fast down a street in my entire life. I cut through several more gaps to get back to my street. I ran into the house and locked the door. I told my mom about what happened. She wasn't sure if it was just my imagination or if it was being serious though. I'll tell you, I never saw that van again after, and I'm very glad for that. My friends and I were chilling outside one summer night, with beers in hand. We decided to take a group picture. The area behind us was fenced, with some gapping in between, evenly the whole way across. It was not a massive gap though, just about small enough to poke the tip of your thumb through. Anyways, we took the picture and didn't think anything of it until the next day. My friend was trying to tidy up the picture a bit, he said something about removing a red eye. He explained to me that he seemed to be having trouble removing something from a gap in the fenced area. We looked at the picture, only to see that something was staring through the fence as we were posing for the photos. That might not seem like a big deal, but just seeing that red eye there, and the thought of us being completely oblivious to someone watching us, makes me feel very uneasy. He eventually worked it out, though. It was an animal with its paws up on the fence looking through the gap. It had been attracted by the smell of our barbecue ribs. One evening, when I was about 15 or so, I was taking the bus back to my parents' house from out on the town. It was dark out. I specifically remember it being winter and icy as well. I was sat at the back of the bus, and the only available space was right next to me. Some older guy I vaguely remember, who appeared to be around 50, sat down. He spent the entire 30-minute bus ride trying to get my phone number, asking where I was going, and asking where me and my friends liked to hang out. I was pretty freaked out, so I just politely declined all his questions. When I reached my stop, I went to get off, only to notice he was getting off as well. I sprinted out and ran towards my parents. He followed me the exact way, taking each street turn the same. I eventually sprinted down the street and ran right into my parents, who were walking back from the shop. I turned around, only to see him ducking through an alleyway out of sight. I saw him a few more times after that and always refused to get on the bus if he was in the queue. I would phone my parents to pick me up. It still freaks me out to this day sometimes, even if I see someone who vaguely looks like him.
so there were four of us. Gold Coast, Australia. We all lived pretty close to each other, over a span of maybe ten blocks or so. Just a group of school friends, all around 17 years old. One of the guys had a badly sprained ankle, and needed crutches but didn't want to use them. I had stolen them from him and was derping about with them. We had been visiting one of the other guys' houses, when it came time for one of the girls in our group to go home. It was about 8pm, so just after dark. Since we all lived near each other, we offered to walk her home together. We took the longer way past the highway, so we could have a bit of a smoke on the way there. Me hobbling on the crutches and still fucking around. That was until I noticed a strange car on the highway, passing us and going the opposite way. It was a jeep, but the strange thing was it was painted entirely in camo. Odd at that time for the Gold Coast. I pointed it out and had a laugh, but no one else really seemed to care. A block or two later, we were going down one of the side streets, chatting, smoking, walking, and in my friend's case, limping. The camo jeep drove past us again. I freaked out. One of the other guys showed interest as well, but mostly everyone else was more involved in hanging out together and having random chatter. We decided to cut down an alleyway. It was between the houses, a pedestrian alley. Disturbed by the jeep a little, me and one of the guys were sort of joking about it, trying to play it off as a coincidence. As we continued walking through the alley onto our female friend's street, we turned, only to see that exact same jeep driving really slowly towards us. Everyone was paying attention now. It drove past, the sole shadowy occupant clearly watching us as it drove by. How it even got there was anyone's guess. It would have required tons of speed to cut us off like it did. We keep walking. The jeep turns, it follows, its lights go on full beam. It follows even closer behind us. There was still a ways to go, and we were all nervous now. I took the crutches and flailed them above my head, in some display of fuck knows what I was thinking. The jeep followed. I started to feel faint. We could see her house now just across the road. Luckily, I still had the crutches. We got her to her door and her mother answered. The jeep parked right out front of her house, bold as shit. It waited for a second, then drove off in a hurry. Never saw it again, not a one of us. The odd thing is that it knew its way around so well that they had to be a local of the area, but we never saw that car again. <laughs>